Hello and welcome to The Big Leap presented by Clever Tap. It is the series where we shine a light on the pioneers, the marketers, the companies, the growth leaders, all achieving growth through retention. And our guests don't do just that. They talk about the strategies and stories that took them from good to great. In other words, the success of their company, but also their personal growth and strategies. And our guests also reveal the steps, the strategies, the stories that took them from good to great. It's about success, company growth, and also personal growth. And my guest today brings them all together because she works at a company that looks at all of this together. Cardiogram, a company that organizes your mobile health data, making it meaningful, useful, and above all, actionable. And speaking of action, well, she's had 15 years of experience in the industry making and shaping growth marketing, a growth marketer for most of her career. She's been focused on B2C, healthcare, technology, health plans, and government agencies. And at present, well, she combines her enthusiasm for all of this with her interest in wearable health technology as well, mobile health care, and personalized medicine above all, all part of her mission to build high functioning teams and better functioning people helping us with our health. Hey, Stacy Earl, welcome to The Big Leap. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to connect with you. And it is. It's a second time we had a webinar earlier um, talking about your work, your VP of Marketing at Cardiogram, and looking also at what you've done to grow through retention because, of course, your chief responsibilities, your business is all about making users more, first of all, use the app frequently, but also trust it. And that's important for any healthcare app. It's um, a bit difficult to balance sometimes, and you're expanding very much from what you were doing in your lines of business to app marketing. What are you bringing with you in your own talent to, to make that connection? So, yeah, I've been involved in growth and marketing for of healthcare tech for over 15 years now. But, you know, I think from a personal um I am I am very much into mobile health. If you can see both of my wearables here, I have wow. my Garmin on one wrist and my Whoop on the other. So, oh, cool. um, uh, yeah, I I just I have a, a a real passion for mobile health data. I think that we can use uh, mobile health to really reduce the cost of of healthcare overall. Um, help equalize you know access to care and use this technology for um, you know, prediction and early diagnosis of healthcare. So it's a real passion for me. And so it was, it was a joy when I was you know, asked to join uh, Alimaview, who's the parent company of Cardiogram, and, um, and really see what we could do to help people who have heart health concerns uh, use Cardiogram and their uh, its pre-diagnosis capabilities to give them some peace of mind so that they don't have to worry as much. And the predictive aspect, when I think about it, Stacy, so very important. Not only because it's going to help you know entire systems and organizations give everyone healthcare if we're watching it and taking care of it, um, we can be more effective, not only in how healthcare is provided, but how we're taking care of ourselves. Yes, yes, absolutely. You know, so many of our users have heart concerns and maybe it's atrial fibrillation or um, long haul COVID or POTS, or maybe they just, you know, have a family background and they want to make sure that their heart stays healthy as, as long as possible. Um, but we're also able to use heart rate data uh, and other background data um, to actually predict your risk of other related metabolic conditions like diabetes, uh, hypertension, and sleep apnea. Um, so it's, it's really fascinating what machine learning can do these days. Yeah, and we're on, we're we're really at the cusp of that. You said machine learning, and that's bringing it all together. The value proposition of your app is about service, but it's also very complex. 
you know, it's a complex product to market. It's a product that you need to, the more you educate me, the more I'm going to understand, appreciate, and use it. How do you approach customer education, user education about all the different options, all the different, all the different advantages? Well, one of the first things we have to do is we have to make sure that we differentiate ourselves from um, the data that's freely available, right? So anyone can have an Apple Watch and they can have Apple Health and they can see generally, you know, what what was my resting heart rate, my average resting heart rate for the day? We have to first differentiate ourselves from those, you know, free apps that are out there. And, you know, we do that with, you know, really detailed information. Um, but we also really have to earn their trust. Um, and so, you know, we make sure we stay rooted in science. Our machine learning data scientists work with clinicians as they develop and refine our algorithms. Um, and our content always comes with receipts, as they say. We provide links to the studies that we're basing our content on. And those studies are trusted institutions like universities or the American Heart Institute, not just a recycled listicle. So the interesting thing about user education is that it's also a way to engage. It is a way to build trust, to your point. And that is all about ultimately getting people through the funnel, getting them through onboarding, turning them from free to fee and payers. But tell me a little bit about what you're doing to get people to register and even commit to a trial. So part of that starts with um, our app marketing, you know, within the app stores, both, you know, app um, and the Play Store. And, uh, and that means, you know, we have to start with uh, that kind of differentiation again, you know, and showing people really what the features are that are going to help them. Um, you just can't say enough about video, right? Pictures worth a thousand words. Um, but we also use user testimonials. So work very closely with our customer service team and they are pass along those emails to me uh, that are user testimonials that say, you know, here's how cardiogram helped me. And so then we reach out to those people and we ask them, you know, if they would work with us on video content or if we can use their quote. And so we, we really want people explaining to other people how to use cardiogram as well. You've got to show the value of the product early on. And especially as, you know, the economy is tightening down, um, that's differentiating it from the free options out there. And also extremely smart. I'm thinking, Stacy, you've gone for, you know, the not even I wouldn't even say micro influencers. You've gone for real people at a time when everyone says you have to be authentic in your marketing. So um, smart move, smart move. What about the approaches that you are employing? OK, I'm using the app. I'm excited. I'm in my trial. Uh, but you also want to keep me motivated because the more I use it, the more I'm going to appreciate it. What are you doing to keep excitement levels, interest levels high? You know, of course, nothing beats rolling out a new feature, uh, but <laughs> that's just not possible on, you know, kind of a weekly basis. So we really focus on educating people on how to use the existing features to manage their conditions. And in addition to that, we really keep people involved on new algorithms that we're developing. Um, so we ask our users to participate in that development. Um, for instance, right now we have two programs going on, one for uh, early prediction of migraines and the other one for atrial fibrillation. I'm just thinking through what you're doing is you are allowing, empowering, enabling, I don't know the word for it, but the idea is be a part of the community, work with the app, and you can contribute to the greater good of algorithms that are going to help us help you, but help everybody else. Exactly. Yes. So it really does start to feel more like a community. One North Star is always going to be you know, sessions and sessions within a certain period or you know, session length. But again, you are 
part of my routine. You're part of my life. You're my life coach. And I love what some people say about health apps is that um, they're also part of a personal operating system. You know, I'm giving you my data and you're helping me manage my life. So what other metrics do you have to look at to say, yes, this is the way we direct our efforts or our resources to deliver on that really important promise, which is really, you are my assistant. So it's interesting because in gaming apps, you might be looking for users that have really long session times, right? They get in there and they just can't put it down. But in our app, I'm looking for users that are coming to the app multiple times a day for probably very short periods of time. Maybe they're looking to see how their heart rate recovered after a workout, or maybe they're tagging a symptom that they experienced so that they can share it with their doctor later on. So for me, I'm looking at how much time in app per day, so per daily user, um, and how many sessions per daily user. Those are kind of two really good metrics for us. And so we're always constantly tweaking our onboarding and our outgoing on our, our outgoing messaging to see what impacts those metrics. Yeah, I'm wondering what does impact those metrics. Maybe just a little peek under the hood. Um, yes. Well, t we talked about it a little bit early on, but one of those was those participation in those new programs that we're working on. Um, that's worked so well for us. Oh, wow. It's been a year ago now where we asked people to participate in a survey about long haul COVID. And of course, you know, this is pretty late in the game. There's been a lot of information about COVID out there. So we really weren't sure how much, how interested people would be in participating in that survey. But uh, within a week, we had 30,000 responses to that survey. And what we saw was the people who responded to that survey also, you know, had more time in app, more sessions per daily. So those metrics kind of went up for them. And so it goes back to that feeling, I think, that they are participating in in that greater good of, of developing, you know, um, better health care for all. There's um, so much value in data and having access to that data is is just crucial to health care, I believe, in this day and age. And it's also a hook for your app, because what I'm also doing is I'm Unlike a free app, which will give me snapshots, I'm able to see patterns. I'm able to see not just patterns, but some logic. Something is, something is going on in my health and I can see what triggers it and how I can improve it or whatever needs to be done. I've just got more of those insights. Tell me a little bit about what some of the hooks, triggers that work for your app. We know it works for your users. What works for your app to make it habit forming, to improve that engagement? So we really have to work really closely with our engineering team and our product manager uh, to make sure that every time we're building in a feature, we're thinking about um, personalization. We're thinking about the events that they're passing along to us and um and how we can use those events in and that data in our marketing um, and in our journey to ultimately um, retain users um, and also make sure that they're getting as much value as they can out of the app. So um, that's that's a huge challenge. So Cardiogram has been around almost seven years now, and it, it wasn't designed with that in mind. So. As a marketer speaking to another, you know, marketer or maybe, a, you know, someone who's just starting to develop an app, I would say, you know, make sure that you think about marketing and you think about, you know, that personalization right up front from the beginning as you're building the app in, because it's hard, harder to do later on down the line. So I have to ask you, what does, I know what designing for retention looks like. What does designing for personalization look like? So for personalization, it's, it's thinking about, you know, we started off with, I think, you know, kind of four user personas. And so you have to really kind of put yourself in, in their shoes and think about, you know, what, what information is personal to them. Um, and it's different for someone who is 
call we call them the worried well right so so they're well but they want to make sure that they stay that way um you know what personalization is for them looks different than personalization for that pots person you know that i talked about the worried well doesn't want to be spoken to as if they're ill as if they're sick um, but the pots person needs you know compassion and so the more data we have like that, it helps us, you know, even personalize our emails and our tone um, or our messages, you know, so um, our push notifications are not one size fits all. We can use that information that we're getting to help tailor those better. As you said it yourself, personalization permeates every aspect of messaging. You understand your segment and then you adapt your messaging accordingly. Worried well, wants to be treated a different way. And for example, those with POTS. Now to do this requires talent and a tech stack. Tell me a little bit about both over at Cardiogram. Yes, so we use CleverTap. Um, we initially were on Lean Plum, we've transitioned over to CleverTap. And so it's, it's really critical to have a MarTech solution that is built for apps. I, I just can't emphasize that enough. I mean, as someone who transitioned into app marketing uh, about almost two years ago now, uh, it's a whole different world, you know, because I can actually see how people are interacting within the app, the actions that they're taking, those the events, right? And, um, and then market to them accordingly. Uh, so that means that you have to have a, a very analytical mindset. You have to create these trees, these ever branching trees. Um, so instead of just having one um, one message pathway, you're you're building a tree out with nodes depending on the the personalization. Uh, you might start with one path and then you say, okay, now if this person is a worried well, we're going to take them in this direction. And if this person has a healthcare concern they're trying to manage, then we're going to take them in this direction. And then you keep branching from there. So you end up with very complex marketing, which means that you need a content developer who thinks about that and can develop you know, the, the content accordingly. And you need a very patient, creative person who will then go in and, and develop, you know, this entire um, campaign that branches in all of these different ways. You talk about the content there. I mean, it has to be empathetic. You have to understand the user. Um, you have to make it count because of course it is app marketing. It's about getting someone through a funnel. How do you show that you care, share, share their concerns, share their values? How do you speak to them in a way that resonates? All my credit goes to my team. So um, yes, I really can't give them enough credit. So um, th they are Alexa Kurtz, who is our content developer and JD Dolly is creative and they are just an unstoppable team together. So they somehow managed to get just the perfect blend of compassion and empathy while still presenting what sometimes is dry scientific data in a kind of lighthearted way. And, and I think that one of the things that I had to do as a leader was allow Alexa to develop that voice and, and give her the leeway you know, and, and not micromanage um, what she was writing. So uh, I think it all started when she developed uh, a closing tagline that we use on all of our emails, which is cheering you on from behind the screens. And <laughs> and it, it. Was, it was just that great blend of, of humor and, you know, support that, that worked so well. And so from there on now, I don't edit what Alexa writes, I might tweak a word here or there, but I, I really let that team, you know, perform, do do their thing. I love the humor. She's a keeper. Alexa. <laughs> yes. It's it's really not easy to do that. And it's actually quite quite hard work to match that with the channels. I'm just curious if we could like take a, a trip through the journey that you're building. Let's say um, channel that works best when you want someone to subscribe. 
in the early stages of engagement, push works really well, right? In, in when people are just discovering the app, I definitely have to say push works super well, but uh, I can't discount email. I know it's old school, but we have an average of 41% open rates for our email. And maybe that's just the age of our users, which tend to skew older. Um, but, um, but you can't forget that. Um, we implemented an in-app mailbox uh, only about three or four months ago. Um, and so our users are still getting used to that. But really what I think about is which channels are they subscribed to? And so I make sure that I, we start with a long form piece of content every time. So we start, always start off with a blog post and we put that on our web. So we have SEO, et cetera. But the other reason why that's important is because then that blog post can be used to create an email message. And then it can also be used to create a push message and an in-app mailbox message. And so for those, right, I can't push someone to an email, but what I can do is push them to blog content. And so it's important that I have all three of those to get users exactly in the channel that they want to use, not just the channel I want to use. Good point, because it's really not up to you. It's up to them. They will come where they want to. Yes. Next question for you, a good engagement experience or journey, what does it look like? something that's that causes them to want to learn more, right? So it causes them to take action, um, whether it is to open the app, whether it is to go read a blog post, or whether it is to participate in uh, development of a new algorithm. And so, um, so I'm ultimately looking for them to take action, which of course then I can use CleverTap to, to measure how many people took an action out of that? Um, how many people, you know, did I convert? Whether, whether conversion meant clicking on something and going somewhere and taking an action or conversion meant subscribing. Good question here then. It's all about figuring out that journey, but of course you have a personal journey as well. And it's a lot of trial and error. Tell me about the biggest personal mistake you've made that turned out to be the biggest personal win because, of course, we always learn from our mistakes, Stacey. <laughs> um, yes, not testing. <laughs> um, learning, knowing, you know, working in new technology. And um, so, yeah, when, when we were first, you know, using the smart tech stack and we, then the first time we decided to send users out to ask them to do this survey and... Um, and, and then we found out that we didn't quite have everything linked up correctly. So we were, we were trying to push their user ID over to the survey so we could match up data with their survey responses. And, um, yeah, it didn't quite go as planned. And so, uh, a very, and, but we got phenomenal response. And so then very quickly I had to turn around with all this egg on my face and we had to write this email. In, in like minutes, right? That says, oops, you know, we messed up and, um, and, and please. And I think every, every marketer does this at some point in their career. Right. But, um, yeah, uh, better testing, uh, or also don't roll it out to, you know, 500,000 people at, at once, you know, just roll that out to, uh, you know, a thousand people and test it out first to make sure it's working right. So, um, yeah, so that was a great lesson for us. We learned a lot in, in doing that. And um, so now we have much, much better testing protocols and we roll things out a little bit slower um, than we did before. Slow and steady winning the race. But a good point is also, Stacey, I've been reading it in a lot of research as well, is that once you've built up a relationship with your user base and you do make a mistake, they're much more forgiving. So yes. It's yes. like, yeah, we get it. But you probably have users that are saying, you know what, as long as you keep on involving us in your programs and your projects and that, and we're helping everybody, you know, make a couple mistakes along the way. We, there's that saying, right? That people who do a lot can also make a few mistakes. Yes. <laughs> the more you yeah. do, the more mistakes you may make. Yeah. And we're at an interesting point in our journey now. Our, our, so we're making a change to our revenue model. 
price. For the first six years that Cardiogram was around, it was a freemium model. And so, you know, we had free users who then we were trying to convert to premium. And in December of last year, we changed that model and we said, okay, now we have a 30 day free trial, which is quite lengthy. Um, but after that, there is no free version anymore. And of course we needed to do, to do that really for revenue. We, we had um, 250,000 monthly active users. Um, but out of those, we had about 50,000 subscribers. So we had all these people who were using the app, um, but weren't paying for anything. And so we, we really had to take a look at that. And um, okay, so that's easy enough to do for new users coming in. The real challenge now is doing that with old users who have been members for a while. And so we really had to, you know, as we've started converting those users over to paid and eliminating the free, um, we've had to personalize again, you know, and we've had to rely on that relationship that we've built. Um, we had to, you know, part of our messaging was uh, using personalization again. You've been a member for X amount of time. You've been a member since December 1st, 2018. And, um, and really helping them understand we've been giving them free for a very long time. And, um, uh, and then also relying on that relationship for them to understand the position that we're in, that we can't continue to provide free for forever. There are data costs associated with it. There are personnel resources associated with it. Um, it was a hard decision to make for a marketer uh, or for a company, you know, and hard to implement as a marketer. I think it's the same approach because of your content, because you're so upfront about it. It's, uh, you know, you're stating why it's not out of the blue. There's a reason for this. And also the model itself, you know, you simply have to explain it. And as you said, you're using personalization to do it. Can you give me some idea of how that's working out? I mean, is it possible if you're upfront and honest to say, look, yeah, you're going to have to open up your wallet for me, but I'm giving you value. So we're still working on that data. We've uh, we've been rolling this out for about three or four weeks now, but we're, we're pretty happy with the results so far. I do have some some more lessons learned about that as well. You know, um, like pitfalls you don't think about, you know, where. Um, we, we are telling people that they are being, you know, that they have seven days left when they open the app. Well, and so that starts the email journey, the personalized journey, but I need to make sure they open the app. So, so I really needed a trigger, you know, to make sure that they went in and opened the app when, when maybe they haven't been in for a month or so. Um, so there were some lessons learned around that too. It's, it's been a very interesting journey to go from a freemium model to, you know, a trial subscription. Well, now you've got me going because that is a very, very important and relevant journey as a lot of companies rethink this and say, you know, we have to change the paywalls completely. You know, freemium is out. Um, I will look forward to continuing the journey with you, actually, Stacey, maybe having you back again to tell that because there's nothing better than practical advice from a practitioner. And if you have said you have seen the pitfalls, experienced them, and can warn us about them, then that is valuable in and of itself. I certainly will be happy to do that. Thanks again for sharing and for being so candid because that's it. We want to know what works and what doesn't. And some people don't want to share that journey, but you have done exactly that. So it's been a perfect, perfect match to have you on The Big Leap. Thanks again, Stacy. Thank you, Peggy. And this has been The Big Leap. For our audience, we also publish this video as a podcast, which is easy for you to consume on the go, on the train, on the plane, wherever you may be. And if you're listening to the audio version, you can also see the video. Just search for The Big Leap on YouTube. This show is all about shining a light on amazing marketers who took The Big Leap to achieve growth through retention. So if you have a story to tell, hook up with me on LinkedIn, and we may get you set up with a show of your own. Until then, this is Peggy Ann Saltz for Clever Tap and The Big Leap.